All right. So, in the past uh, couple of lectures, we learned about interfacing with microsystems and microsensors in general. And uh, we also talked about, you know, the types of circuits that you may have, focusing on some more common ones. And then we looked at the issue of noise. And uh, we said that, okay, so noise is the phenomena uh, or phenomenon that uh, limits the um, resolution of your sensor. It puts a limit on how small a signal or how small a change in the uh, variable that you're interested in you can detect with that particular sensor plus its interface electronics. So, uh, you know, once you design a system, usually that's that, right? So the only thing you can do to reduce noise is through uh, averaging or, or limiting the bandwidth of measurement. So we saw that the noise power is always proportional to the bandwidth of measurement. So the, your only option to reduce noise practically is uh, to limit the bandwidth of measurement, right? So there are some extreme cases where you want to go and cool down the system and things like that. Uh, in most situations, you do not have, uh, in, at least you know, practically or financially, that much uh, resources. So your limit will be bandwidth, uh, or your uh, only option is to limit bandwidth, and uh, that comes at a cost. If you reduce the bandwidth of your system, you have to wait longer to, um, let's say, read a value for your DC measurements or low frequency measurements. That's one issue. And then you may miss all the important information that, is ha that are happening uh, at higher frequencies. So let's see what else we can do. And that, you know, from the device and system perspective, that's it. You basically have no other choice. From this lecture onwards, we're going to talk about signal processing and how we process the data that comes from these sensors. The first thing that we are going to attack is noise. We want to see what we can do to reduce the noise. Uh, if we have, let's say, requirements for the measurement, uh, how do we m try to meet those requirements? And then following that, we're going to talk about um, machine learning, right? This is a fairly common uh, word that you see nowadays or hear nowadays, uh, where the machines decide on the context. Not only they measure quantities, but they can also tell you something about the context of whatever that was going on in the environment. Um, these are, uh, you know, basically they have cognition in addition to measurement capabilities. Now they can figure out you know, it was, this room was hot. Not that the temperature was this much, but it was hot or cold or, or convenient or not. All of those things, okay? So you basically create a picture out of the colors or variety of the colors that are provided by uh, your sensors to you. Now, let's start about the sensor fusion part first, and then we cover the uh, machine learning and statistical learning aspects in the following lecture videos. So what is sensor fusion? Well, in the broadest terms, it is about collecting data from different sources of information and bringing them together to basically improve one aspect of the system performance. Uh, so for example, here is a robot where you want to know where this robot goes. So you utilize a variety of sensors here. So in this case, for our uh, fellow here, we may have uh, pyroelectric body sensors. These are sensors that, for example, detect humans that, have, uh, that sit at a relatively higher temperature in most environments. You can have a CCD camera that you can actually capture images from the uh, environment around you and try to figure out what is what and maybe even the distance if you have more than one camera available to you. You can have laser rangefinders. So this is what you use in order to estimate the distance to an object more accurately if it is of concern to you, you know, if it is something that is of interest to you. And you can have uh, all sorts of sonar sensors. So these are less expensive and, you know, usually less precise and accurate, but they're, you can put multiple of them around your system and then look at the reflections of the sonar waves from the objects or, or um, barriers around you in order to uh, um, navigate inside an environment. So 
you have all these sensors but your goal is navigation your goal is to find your location now if you have a map then you can use that map to, to navigate to whatever that you want or to know your location now and stay safe um, these sensors as we just mentioned have different capabilities right so for example your laser rangefinder may be uh, very accurate in estimation of distance but your pyroelectronic sensor is essentially a detector type. It's a yes-no type of a sensor. You know, they, you cannot really estimate the range to an object that easily with a pyroelectric sensor. With a laser rangefinder, you can do it very well. With a, um, uh, for example, sonar sensor, well, you can still measure the range, but maybe not with that level of accuracy. And what you want to do is to utilize all of these information sources, right? You don't want to dismiss uh, some because basically you, you didn't put enough computational power into your system. And uh, what we are going to do now is that, in our true sensor fusion topic, what you go and do is that you assign some belief factors to the outputs of these sensors. So you say, you know what, if, if my laser rangefinder tells me that the distance to that object is two meters plus and minus one centimeter, and my acoustic sensor says it's 1.8 meters plus and minus 5 centimeters, I trust that laser rangefinder a bit more. So I'm going to give a bit more weight to that number, to the 2 meter number, while I do not want to dismiss the acoustic sensor data as well. So I want to use this piece of information, but I will probably trust the laser rangefinder a, a bit more. So how do I find out with these weights that I give or assign to different sensors. So that's one topic. The other topic is that sometimes your sensors are measuring different things, right? So for example, if you look at a drone example, uh, the drone can be flown over and then sometimes it's automatic pathfinding and all that. You need to know your acceleration and angular velocity for an object in the space. If you have the three-axis acceleration and three-axis angular ve velocities and you know where you took off from, you should be able to figure out your current location if you know what are the inputs to the system. Well, that's all good, but you know, that's basically a very an ideal model, and we usually go and take advantage of other types of sensors that we may have in order to correct for whatever that can create inaccuracies, let's say, in the output of your accelerometer. So, for example, drift is one, right? So, or angular velocity, usually you have a sensitivity problem as well as drift problem. So what you can do, for example, is that you can put a GPS receiver on your drone and then capture location data as well as acceleration and angular velocity. You can put a compass on your drone and capture the direction information, you know, relative to the magnetic north. And, uh, you know, with that, those two sensors, you're basically helping the first two but it's not the same quantities. You're measuring magnetic fields in one case, and in another case, you're measuring the exact location or, or the coordinates. And how do you combine these data from different types of sensors, different types of measurements with each other in order to basically produce the ultimate output, which could be, for example, your location at this point uh, from that, all of that data. Now, let's talk about the problem now. What we have, let's focus at, for now on cases where the sensors are producing the same sort of data. So for example, I have uh, the laser rangefinder that I talked about in the previous slide plus the sonar uh, sensor that I'm going to again use for estimating the distance to objects. Both of them are doing the same thing for me. So let's look at this case shown on the graph below. I have one sensor that has a narrower peak, you know, the width of that uh, signal in this case the, basically is, a, uh, is an indication of um, um, the variance in that data, how much trust I can have in that data, how much variability do I get. So it's like, let's say for the laser range pointer, it was two meters plus and minus one centimeter. For the sonar sensor, it could be, uh, you know, let's say in this case, if we say the wider pan graph is for a sonar sensor, it could be, let's say, 2.1 meters plus and minus 5 centimeters. Uh, 
I want to use both of these. Each one of them is giving the same data. The accuracies are different, the precision are different, but I want to use, utilize both and see if I can find a signal that is better than both of those individually. Um, so in this case, let's assume the two signals that are coming in, X1 and X2, are um, independent measurements. You know, one is with the laser rangefinder, the other one is with an acoustic sensor. They should not affect each other. Uh, and what we are going to assume further is that the, these sources, this data that is coming from uh, these two sensors has a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution with a mean of mu1 and variance of sigma1 uh, squared for the first sensor and for x2 I have mu2 and uh, variance, you know, sigma2 squared for the second sensor. We are going to ignore the temporal dependence of the noises and measurements between the measurements. And what we want to do is that we want to come up with the third signal, let's say Z, that is taking a fraction of X1 and a fraction of X2, adds them to each other, such that I get basically the uh, mathematically or statistically best signal at the output, right? So Z is AX1 plus BX2. My goal is to figure out what those A and B coefficients should be so that I have the minimum variance in this case, right? So variance is where I'm going to focus on. You know, remember from the previous lectures that noise is the variance in your data. So what I want to do is that I want to minimize that noise. So I want to get that green signal. Now, what I want to do now is that I want to go and uh, make an assumption or through some of the discussion that you'll see in the following uh, slides. The assumption ho over there is that, you know, the sensor that has less noise is, well, noise means precision, remember? You know how close the measurements are to, together. So I'm going to make the assumption that the sensor that has less noise is also more accurate. Well, again, remember, what was accuracy? Accuracy was how... Uh, close is the measured value to the true value. Whatever the actual parameter is, you can measure it and you can be close to this value or far from it. And precision is the spread. You know, I can measure it with a lot of spread over here or a lot of spread over here, but this is, a, uh, this is an accurate sensor that is not very precise. This is a sensor that is not very accurate, but it's precise. So, the assumption that I'm going to make over the next couple of slides or what you will see through the graphs is that the more accurate sense, the less noisy sensor, the more precise sensor is also more accurate. That's not always the case. And if you go back to the slides that we had many lectures ago, you know that, okay, say so if I have a precision problem, I go and fix it by using lower noise sensors or coming up with methods to reduce noise. If I have an accuracy problem, my only choice is to go and calibrate the sensor. So go and pick a sensor that knows what it says or, or I have trust in what it says and compare my own sensor with that and then uh, calibrate the sensor. So that's your only solution. If, if mu1 and mu2 are different, you really do not know which one is more accurate, which one is closer to the true value, you have to do a calibration. But sigma1 and sigma2 can be quite different and the goal here is to come up with a sensor or, or a signal that has the lowest variance, the lowest noise, by combining these two important, uh, these two independent signals that we have. Okay. So, and again, I think it should be fairly obvious that when you have two sensors that you've paid, you know, a lot of money for a really good sensor and then not so much money for an average sensor, you probably would like to give more weight to the data coming from your good sensor, right? Well, just be careful that just because you're paying more, it doesn't necessarily mean that every aspect of the, the system that you're getting is better than the other. But it just feels intuitively right that the sensor that has a better performance, in this case we're talking about variance or, or noise, uh, we trust that sensor a little bit more. Right? So we would like to give more weight to, that, to the data from that sensor compared to the uh, data from a noisier sensor. The question is that how much, right? So how, how do we want to combine that? So 
let's assume Z is a linear combination of X1 and X2. If that's the case and X1 and X2 are two independent random variables, the mu for Z is, again, you know, a linear combination of mu1 and mu2, same coefficients A and B. And the variance for Z comes from the expression shown over there as well. So it's A squared sigma X, uh, um, sigma 1 squared plus B squared sigma 2 squared. Now, well, if I'm measuring a quantity, I want to get, you know, regardless of how I combine these di different uh, sensors, I want to get the same measurement at the output. So, for example, if I'm measuring the la using that laser rangefinder example, if I'm measuring distance, right, and it says about two meters, and then the acoustic signal, uh, sensor says about two meters, I want to combine these two such that I say, let's say, two meters from the laser rangefinder, 2.1 meters from the acoustic sensor, but I trust the uh, laser rangefinder a bit more, but maybe the acoustic sensor is, knows something that, that this guy doesn't. So, you know, maybe my best estimate is 2.1 meters or 2.2 meters, 2.01, instead of, let's say, 2.1 that the acoustic sensor set or 2 that the laser rangefinder set. Maybe it should be 2.01. So I give a little bit of weight to what uh, the acoustic sensor says, but not so much. At the end of the story, the scale is the same. So, me, that scale being the same means that, you know, A plus B should be 1. It's like saying, you know, this many percentage of the data comes from this sensor and this much percentage from the second sensor. You basically make sure that A plus B is 1 so that you keep the same scale for your Z as you did for your X1 and X2. And if you do that and you want to minimize the variance in Z, if you go through a little bit of ex uh, simple calculation with the condition or constraint that A plus B should be 1, you can come up with optimal coefficients. So if you go through the math, you can show that A should be sigma 2 squared plus over sigma 1 plus sigma 2 squared. And B should be, you know, basically simply 1 minus A or sigma 1 squared over sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared. Okay, so I know A and B. If I know the variance of the first signal and the variance of the second signal, now I, I know how I should optimally combine them. You can also write uh, Z as this or maybe this. So you can write Z as a combination of, let's say, X1 plus some K times the difference between X1 and X2. Okay? So if I want to write it this way, then the value of k is given by this expression here, sigma 1 squared over sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared. And you can right away see that this value, or k, is going to always be between 0 and 1. Right? So that's the range of uh, variables depending on the extremes for sigma 1 and sigma 2. k is always between 0 and 1. So that's that. Right? So if I have two sensors and I know their variances or the noises from them, that's how I combine them. That's the optimum combination of the signals from two sensors. And uh, by doing that, I can then show very quickly that sigma z for the new combination, for that uh, new signal z, sigma z squared is given by this expression, or we can again rewrite it as a function of k. It's 1 minus k times sigma 1 squared. So, or you can write it in a similar fashion for um, sigma 2 squared. But whatever that you, the way that you take, you can right away see that sigma z squared now, or variance of z, is less than the variance of the signal from uh, the first sensor or the second sensor, right? But, um, you know, whatever the variance for the first signal was, even if it was a very, very good sensor and low noise, by combining, you know, let's say even a crappy sensor data with it, you will do better. Okay. Let's look at some examples and then we'll come back to why this is important nowadays. Here is a case. I have two sensors, same variance, you know, the same uh, type of measurements. Let's say these, these could be two very similar sensors or maybe same devices that you bought off the shelf. I'm showing different views for illustration purposes only, right? So ideally, you should have done your calibration before starting to use the sensor. So the views should fall on top of each other. Uh, I'm 
assuming different mu's here just for illustration purposes so that you can see the combined signal a bit uh, more clearly and what happens to it. But in general, uh, yeah, you, you shouldn't have a mu problem. You should take care of the calibration problem before the measurement. And then after that, uh, you focus on reducing the noise. So in the case that you use two similar sensors, well, obviously, you want to give equal weights to both of them. You know, there's no difference to, to the data from these two. You trust them equally. And then what you can go and see is that, okay, so this is going to be the combined sensor. Sigma Z has gone down from, and I'm looking at standard deviation now, has gone down from 1 to 0.7. Or if you look at the variance, the variance has gone from 1 to actually 1 over 2. That's a significant improvement. Um, if you assume that one sensor has, let's say, half the noise of the other one, so sigma z is 0.5 while sigma 2 is 1, then you can see that you know, if you go through that process, we get a combined signal that now it's actually closer to the good signal, right? So we have uh, a larger weight for the data from the good sensor, but I still keep the data from the uh, lower quality data source as well. My good sensor had a sigma 1 of 0.5. Now the combination is 0.447. So I've made some improvement here. You know, I'm still doing better than even my best sensor that I had in the bunch. But um, the effect is less obvious, right? And then finally, if there's a significant difference between the sensors, so let's say one has a noise that is five times less than the other one, and you combine them, at the end of the story, you'll see, well, the low noise sensor is going to dominate your output. The one that you have the least amount of variance from it, you trust it the most. You give the most weight to that data, to that data source. But nonetheless, including those other data sources improves your, uh, your overall noise performance, okay? Now, let's go through one quick example here. So the example is, and I'm actually going to just go through these and tell you the numbers. You can verify it at your end. The question here says that we have a couple of temperature sensors. One is a thermocouple, the other one is an electronic one. And we're using them to measure the temperature of let's say, the same object or, or the same, let's say, rule. Now, the question is that I have two independent measurements, and I want to use them both. How do I optimally combine them? So in the first case, we assume that the variance or the noise of the thermocouple sensor is the same as the noise of the electronic sensor. And if that is the case, well, we record that we can calculate the coefficients for these two from the A and B expressions showed to the right. And you can go and show that, okay, so in this case, if they have the same noise, we use 0.5 of that or 0.5 of that. Or, or, or we basically equally combine them. The weights for both of them is going to be 1 over 2. However, if the thermocouple now has uh, half the noise of your uh, electronic sensor, then you will start to see that the scale is going to shift towards, you know, using more or relying more and more on that thermocouple data. So in that case, you can go and should see or show that you want 80% of the data to come from thermocouple and 20% from electronic uh, sensor. And, and the limit, let's say, if my thermocouple is 10 times less noisy than my electronic source, then in this case, if you go and do the calculations, you'll see that I want to keep 99% of the data from the thermocouple and only add 1% of the data from um, the electronic data source, right, or the sensor. So how do we use this? Where do we use this? Well, the example shows you one use case. But this approach to combine data from multiple similar sensors is becoming more and more common nowadays. Remember, you know, when we, had, we, we were dealing with noise, your options to limit noise are really limited. You know, at the device level, you know, if you have an accelerometer, a pressure sensor, whatever that you have, 
Your options to reduce noise are limited. Usually you cannot play with the temperature in most typical applications. If you can, that's a, that's a knob you can turn. But then again, your choices or, or the limits are uh, going to become apparent very quickly. Uh, so once you have a system with a given noise performance, uh, that's basically it. And if you want to improve the noise performance by a factor of two, let's say, uh, you're going to have a hard time finding a sensor at about the same cost to do the job. Usually, you know, if you have a sensor that has a such and such noise performance and you want to buy one that is, let's say, five times better in terms of noise performance, you do not pay five times more. You may pay ten times more or a hundred times more to get that uh, improvement in the noise performance. And all of it is because of the challenges we have to reduce noise. So nowadays, this approach has become an acceptable way of reducing your noise. So let's say if you want to reduce your noise by a factor of two, going back to all the discussion that we had, what you can do is that you can buy four sensors with the same noise performance and just average out the output of those sensors. Right away you get an improvement that is proportional to uh, the number of sensors. So basically, you know, again, you have seen this in your statistics. If your variables, if your random variables have the same um, variance and you combine n of them with each other, the overall variance of this combination is going to be uh, n times less. Or if you look at the noise, it's going to be 1 over square root n times less. So if you want to half the noise of your measurement, you can buy four sensors, and square root of four is two, so your noise will go down by a factor of two. Well, a factor of two is not really that much, but the same way you can go down by a factor of three, by a factor of four, by a factor of five. So people do actually, in some cases, buy 25 similar sensors, put them right next to each other, and average out the signals from all of these. And that's perfectly fine. We know what lets us do that is a couple of things. First of all, well, the statistics says that if I have 25 sensors, I will have five times less noise. But if I want to buy a sensor that it has five times less noise, I probably have to pay probably 100 times more than my cheap sensor. So I'm saving money. It's more cost effective. On the other hand, these sensors are now so cheap and so small that, you know, having 25 of them is not a huge deal. You pay 25 cents for a sensor, 25 of them is going to cost you still like 6 bucks or 7 bucks. It's not a lot of money. And because they're small, you can pack them close to each other, very close to each other, and then still maybe, uh, you know, have a manageable dimension for even a large number of these sensors. On the other hand, because we are dealing with sensor data, you know, our typical operating bandwidths are not that high. Typically, for most consumer cases, you know, if you have one kilohertz of bandwidth, that's more than enough. In most situations, it's actually hundreds of hertz. So the data rate is not too high. So a tiny microprocessor nowadays can handle the data from even 25 or, or maybe more of these devices relatively easily. So the abundant comput computation power that you have uh, comes to your help, comes to the uh, help of, let's say, whoever that is using multiple sensors uh, for, for instead of one. And uh, there was one other point that I cannot remember, so maybe remind me in the live session. But anyway, this is acceptable nowadays, or, or a practiced approach that use multiple similar sensors in order to get um, a lower noise output, a higher quality output. Now, let's go and step a little bit further. What we want to do now is to actually go and say, you know, I have random variables. I, the sensor data, you know, I have a process. I'm just getting the data from the sensors. And I trust these sensors to basically report uh, faithfully to me. In most cases, you actually even have, especially as an engineer in engineering applications, you have a system model, right? So for example, if you have an object 
and you drop it, well, you can use a uh, laser rangefinder to measure the distance to this object as it is falling. Or you can have an accelerometer on this device and measure the acceleration as it is falling and use that to estimate the distance. But you have uh, a couple of you know, different parameters that you can measure here. At the same time, you know the Newton's laws of motion. You can go and say, okay, I know the original location. You know, my uh, mechanics in this area is fairly established, and, and I, I think I can trust my system model here. And, you know, without using the sensor data, you can go and estimate the location of this object at any time. Right? So I can have the sensor data that report the location of the object to me at any time. Or I can have my system model that you know, knowing your initial location and acceleration, you go and estimate or predict where the uh, object is at any point after it, uh, let's say, at, after we let go of it. Now, here is the concept. Let's look at that system model. Let's look at that model output as a virtual sensor. Let's think of it as something that is reporting to us values regarding the location of this device and treat it as a sensor output. And now the question is that, you know, with this extra information that you have about the system, can you improve on what your, the sensors alone tell you? Right? So, so goes back to what we just covered. Previously, we had two independent sensors and one was report, you know, both of them were reporting the same parameter to you and you wanted to optimally combine them. Now, we have a virtual sensor, right? So post-COVID, you should be, uh, I think, comfortable with the term virtual now. We use the system model as a virtual sensor. And what we want to do is that, well, we have this model, we know its properties, we know its outputs, we know the variance in its outputs, you know, the, the process noise and all that and we have a measurement, an independent measurement by a sensor. And can I combine them in order to improve, uh, let's say, the measurement alone or the modeling alone? And the answer is yes, and the process is uh, called sensor fusion, and what we do is we actually use a Kalman filter. So what is a Kalman filter? Now, what we do through Kalman filtering is that, as we said, we have a model and we have a sensor. And we would like to give weights to these uh, two sources of data that are available to us. Okay? So I want to say, I trust my model so much and I trust this data from the sensor so much. Both of them I specify in terms of variances or, or standard deviations or noises. And I want to come up with a weight to give to the output of my model and another way to give to the output of the sensor so that when I combine these two with those two weights, I have the lowest noise. Um, so that's what a Kalman filter does. A Kalman filter goes and combines these two data sources optimally with each other. As is mentioned a little bit uh, higher in this slide, a formal Kalman filter has the capability to actually combine the data from different types of sensors, you know, like the drone example that we mentioned before. It can combine the data from different types of sensors with each other as well. We should we talk about that soon. But let's stick to the simple case that I have a system that produces an output for me and tells this variable is going to be this much at this time, and I have a sensor that is measuring the same variable, and I want to combine them. If that's the case, then um, I can statistically prove or mathematically prove that Kalman filter is the optimum solution. And this, the, the proof is very much similar to what we did for two independent signals, you know, the couple of slides ago. It's just, you know, a fancier way of the proving the same principle. Now, there are some assumptions. We assume that the measurements uh, are linear and the system itself is linearly responding to the, to the inputs. Now, what that means is that you can predict the current state of your system by using a linear combination of the state of the system and some, let's say, weights at the previous time step. Right? So if you know the time what the system status was now, 
and you have a system function, which is a linear combination of all these uh, system states, you can figure out what the system response or state is going to be at this point. I also assume that my sensors are linear. So whatever that I'm measuring is a linear function of that variable, and uh, I don't have any nonlinearity with my sensors. Also, I assume that the system noise, or you know how much uncertainty I have in the output of the model that I have, is independent of my sensor noise, right? So the sensor is doing its job. My model is a virtual sensor. I'm going to assume that these two are independent. And they are not correlated in time or, or, or frequency. The other assumption I make, and this is not a very hard assumption, is that uh, the noise is Gaussian. Well, it happens to be that you know, in the vast majority of the cases, the noises or the random signals that you see because of the central limit theorem behave as a Gaussian signal. And it's not a really hard limit on, on the assumptions we make here, but it just makes some of the calculations a bit easier. And if it is not Gaussian, it's OK. You can probably go and do the calculations a little bit uh, differently. Um, at this point of time, we do not need to assume the sources of noise are independent, especially if you have multiple noise sources in your system, uh, you know, sensor data, measurement data. Usually, that makes your life easier, but it's not necessar necessarily uh, a requirement for Kalman filter. And you can, you know, we assumed the system has to be linear, but you can actually apply it to nonlinear systems as well. And, you know, for those of you that have seen nonlinear mechanical uh, systems or nonlinear electronic systems, you recall that we go and look at the small signal behavior of the system. So basically, you put the system at a bias point, your nonlinear system at the bias point, and you look around the bias point to see what happens to the system output around that bias point. And in that case, we can linearize the system. So that's an extended Kalman filter that you can apply to nonlinear systems. If the nonlinearity is, you know, it's basically you're shifting the bias point. If you have to take into account the nonlinearities a bit more in a bit more detail, you can still do that. But, you know, a typical nonlinear system, you can probably just uh, figure out how it behaves around its bias point and apply the Kalman filter as a linear system to it. And then, as we said, the noise doesn't have to be Gaussian, but some of the calculations are going to be a little bit trickier. Now, recall that if you had two sensors, you know, X and Y, uh, and uh, we want to optimally combine them, this is how we got the best combination, right? So it was X plus some K times one minus X. Y and X are two uh, measurements from the two sensors. And then the value of K was given by the expression shown here. So it is the variance of X over the variance of X plus Y. And if we do it this way, your Z will have a smaller variance than X and actually Y, but we're only looking at X now. So because K is between 0 and 1, you get a smaller variance for Z. This is what we want, right? So we want to reduce the noise. Now, let's take it a step further. Let's assume X is a time series data that is predicted by your model. It's not a measurement data. It's your model output. It's your virtual sensor output. Okay. And Y is an actual measurement. So I have a sensor that is measuring the same parameter for me. And uh, now I have one source of data from the model, one source of the data from the sensor. And the question is that how do I combine this or how do I get this uh, optimal combination out. We're going to go and show you the formal output. So this we have seen before. We saw that this is uh, for the simple case that you have two sensors that are measuring the same parameter and you want to optimally combine them. We're going to take it a little bit further and see you know, what if the sensors are reporting different values and things like that. And Z in this case, you know, if we do this combination according to the equations that you see in the above, is going to be your best estimate. Basically, best in this case means lowest noise estimate for uh, that X at this point. 
Our goal from this whole process is to calculate k, right? So I need to know that coefficient. I know x, it's the module output. I know y, I read it from the sensor. How do I combine these two with each other? That's the uh, k. I need to find that k in order to optimally do that. So let's just start, take it a little bit further. We are going to make it you know, more and more formal and more general. So in this case, if you look at x of t, that's your z. That's your best estimate for what is happening now from the model. You want to go back one step before, combine the measurement that you have from your sensor from the measurement at the step before using a value of k that you want to calculate, and your hope is that the calculation is simple, in order to come up with the best estimate for x at this time. K is going to be that much. Now, well, here is the reason for K, or, or, or using the variable K here. K is your Kalman gain, right? So the goal here is to find your Kalman gain. As we saw before, K is always between 0 and 1. Now, what we want to do is that all you see here is that you need to calculate K all you need to keep, the data that you need from, you know, the operation of your sensor is the data at the previous time step, right? So whatever that it was, a, you know, let's say a second ago, you need to keep that data. You use that data to calculate K. We show you how, and you get the measurement from Y. Overall, it's a very simple calculation set of, you know, you don't need to keep a lot of data, and you don't need to do any... Uh, a very complex calculation. It's relatively straightforward, and it is recursive. You just take the data from the past point and use it to produce uh, the, your best estimate for this point. Each time that you improve your sensor, because, you know, remember, you're not using Z anymore, right? This is the Z, that independent variable that you produced from X and Y, not independent, separate variable that you produced from X and Y. It's not Z anymore, right? It's actually X. I'm, I'm feeding it back into my next cycle. So I'm keeping it the, uh, this x value, this, this best x value, and I use it in the next step, right? It's not that I take this and start working with new x and new y. It is that I keep this for the next calculation. It's a recursive calculation. Now, for that reason, my standard deviation always keeps improving or the noise in this system keeps improving. Well, the improvements are huge in, in the beginning and it saturates a bit later on, but nonetheless, because I'm using my, um, let me get my laser point here. Because I'm using this left side of the equation in the next step to calculate the next uh, x, my sigma needs to be updated. Remember, if I optimally combine these two sensor signals with each other, I had a new sigma for that, let's say, optimum combination. And if I keep recursively using that data back into my uh, calculations, I need to keep updating this sigma, the variance of my data, uh, my, my combination. Now, if I go through these calculations and if I do everything right, I come up with an, um, let's say, uh, faith factor or, or, or how much trust I have in one data resource versus the other. If k is small, and you go into, look into this equation, if k is small, what that means is that you basically do not trust your sensor that much. You trust your model more. And what you get for your next, uh, uh, let's say, x, your net next system state, is essentially your previous one times the model, the whatever transitions that are happening. But if you have a sensor that is really, really good, or, or if you do not know enough about the system to produce a good model for it, then k will approach 1, right? So k, again, going back and looking at the formula here, if sigma y is much, much less than sigma x, this coefficient approaches 1. And in that case, what you have, your best estimate for the variable at this point, 
is probably the, the measurement data, the sensor data. You do not have enough faith in your model. And the goal is, you know, to figure what these numbers are. So a noisy measurement versus a less precise model for the system will get you to different extremes of K. Now, let's go and see how we can do this formally, right? So we, we have kept it so far very simple. You know, the two models, uh, let's say model and sensor are saying the same thing, and, and that was so that we paint a picture for you. So the concepts are very similar. Now let's go and generalize it, right? Let's go and see what if I have inputs to my system, and what if my sensors are measuring different parameters than my, let's say, system state, and things like that. So let's assume that this is my system response. This is how I model my system response. If I have x, the system state, at the previous time step, k minus 1, a times x k minus 1 should give me x at this point, right? So a is what is um, representing what, you know, the system model, basically. Vector u here is your input. So you have a system, so let's say if I throw an object through the air, and let's say it has a propeller or, or an engine behind it, that engine is producing a force that basically is going to affect uh, the output of my system. So U is my input, B is what is going to convert that input to my system state, we're going to talk about that in a second, and W is just noise. It's the uncertainty that I have in my system output. Uh, so in that case of a propeller thing, it could be the wind, it could be the air friction, it could be, uh, let's say, the small things that randomly change your x from what it should have been. So w represents noise. I don't know w, right? That's, that's a random variable that just gets added to my system state and uh, it affects my system performance. I don't know it. But, like noise, I know its statistical properties, or I can come up with its variance. Okay, let's see what these variables are in a bit more detail. X is your system state, you know, for mechanical systems or in classic mechanics, this could be your displacement, velocity, and acceleration, right? These are the three variables that you want to monitor for a system in order to figure out its present state. Depending on the application, they could be, uh, you know, X can have different elements. A is the relationship between the past and current states, right? So I was here with these values of X, and the object is falling, free fall. I have an acceleration on it, or you can actually keep it as part of your X. And what is the current location if I want to figure out the current location based on the uh, previous location. Uh, we know how to do that, right? So it's, you know, one-half acceleration times um, t squared plus velocity times t plus the initial location. And if you're talking about the time step, if you know the location at, let's say, t equal t naught, at t equal t naught plus delta t, you have to say it's one-half the acceleration times delta t squared plus the velocity times delta t, and that's your difference in, uh, or, or the change in location. U is the input to the system, as we mentioned. You know, it may have the same variables as your x, uh, or it may not, right? So, for example, sometimes you want to model U, the engine that is pushing your object forward, as an input acceleration, input force, right? And you may have that acceleration in your system state or not, but that's how you model the input. How you add it to your system equation is through that matrix B. So B is what m that maps the input to your system into your system state variables. And W, as we mentioned, is your noise. Uh, again, you may have it might be possible that you can assign different noise values to different elements of your x vector. So let's say you have some confidence in the x, but the confidence in, in velocity may be worse. So you have a different noise element for that, and then for acceleration it may be worse. You have a different uh, component for that, noise component for that. 
uh, the covariance matrix for noise is just Q, which is going to be a square and by the end matrix. Now, we are assuming that we have some measurements. We are doing some measurements on this system. And in this case, the assumption is that you measure Z. You know, let's say if you are measuring the, uh, going back to that object that, that we threw out in, in air, maybe you're looking at the distance uh, or location of this object directly. Maybe you have a laser rangefinder on it. Maybe you have a GPS receiver on it. Maybe you're measuring the acceleration as it goes through the air. So you're measuring some parameter that is going to help you in order to estimate X. But it may not be one of your system variables directly. It may or may not be. So in case it is not one of your system variables directly, you need to use this uh, conversion matrix H. Right? So H does the mapping between the system state, X, and whatever that you're measuring, Z. OK? And then, because you have sensors, you know, multiple sensors, multiple noise sources, you know, there is some randomness to whatever that you measure. Okay, so that V captures the noise associated with each one of those parameters that you measure. So with these definitions, let's see how we can apply a Kalman filter to a system. So this is my best output. My model says X should be this much. If I know x at k minus 1, this time, the previous time step, I multiply it by a to get a best estimate for x at this point, plus the effect of the input. This is what my model tells me. This is the best estimate for the um, system state based on my virtual sensors. And then what I want to do is that I want to do a measurement, you know, that parameter z over there, and uh, depending on how much trust I have in Z versus XK minus, I want to figure out in a best estimation for X, for the system state, okay? So I go and calculate X, and I go and compare it with the measurement that I have here. Depending on the val value of K, I will either get more of the measurement or more of my system model, and put it as the best estimate for x. How do I calculate k? Well, that's how I calculate k. Now we're dealing with matrices and vectors, so the expression is a bit more involved. You know, the division here, I do not really divide matrices by each other, so what this means is that I go and uh, multiply the numerator here by the inverse of the denominator. Okay, so that's what it means, but to keep the let's say, how the equations look similar to, to what we had in the past. Let's just write it like this. And this is what I can notice. R was the covariance of my uh, um, sensor noise. You know, all those sensors that I have, they have their own noise sources with the covariance matrix R. And HPH, this expression here is my process noise. This is where uh, I basically keep all the uncertainties I have regarding the process noise. But remember that this process noise uh, has to be updated. Right? So remember that you know, when you calculated x and used it as a uh, next step, the variance for that x has to be updated. So I need to update this parameter regularly. How do I do that? Well, I go and calculate or look at the best estimate for the process noise that I had before. And I have the uncertainties that I have actually evaluated. Let's say, you know, this is the effect of, let's say, wind or all sorts of unknown parameters in my process. So that's your Q. That's the covariance of your process noises. And this is the part that you keep updating. You keep bringing up the expected error. You can improve your, ex well, the goal is to improve the expected error. And you can go and calculate it each time. Once you have the variance for your model, you put it in here, and you take into account the variance for your sensor in order to calculate K. Once you calculate K, then what the next thing you can do is that you can go and calculate the uh, 
system error, remember we have to update that variance, right? You can go and calculate it as we saw before, so that's the equation to use, and you go through this cycle. So you report your best estimate here, and once you calculate K to improve uh, your, let's say, estimate of the location, you go and update the error, use it in this loop. It looks a little bit scary. It looks like there's too much going on here, but in fact, you know, this is fairly straightforward. Remember that your matrices, your system states are, let's say, one, two, three, four variables. It's not that big. So A is going to be a four by four matrix, or, or your uh, noise variances, you know, all those things are going to be three by three, four by four matrices. And, uh, you know, the worst thing you have to do here is to invert that uh, expression here to calculate K. But nonetheless, you know, it's a four by four matrix. So a tiny microprocessor nowadays is more than capable of doing this calculation. So the computation is not that difficult. And you do not really have to keep that much data. All you need is the previous data point, right? And you need that previous data point uh, to uh, calculate and you know, update your errors here. Here is a list of variables for you, just a quick reference, you know what the variables in that uh, diagram meant. But at the end of the story, you know, that's, that's the Kalman filter. You know, all the magic, all the stories that you hear about sensor fusion and Kalman filter, that is it. The challenge or, or the engineering comes into choosing your system state variables, choosing or knowing your uh, system noises, right? So some people start from a system noise of zero, that's not a good idea because you may get stuck at zero. It's better to know a, a good neighborhood for your system noises. Mm, sensor noises are usually easier, right? So you just look up the data sheet. Uh, but system noise is something that is under your control. It is your virtual sensor. So it's not a good idea to go and assume that your modeling noise is zero. You may get stuck there. Uh, where do you start? Well, you don't want to make it too large. You don't want to uh, make it, you know, unrealistically large because, yeah, that is the part of the noise that gets updated. But if your Q, if your covariance matrix remains large, then if this is large, then it doesn't really matter how much this PK is changing. So choosing a large value for Q is, again, going to hurt you. What it's going to do is that it's going to say, well, I really do not trust my system model anymore, and, well, and the natural conclusion here is that your model will go and rely on the sensor data entirely. So you need to go and do a little bit of study, at least come up with a reasonable range for the values of your uh, system noises, and then use them. That's probably the tricky part, you know, where your starting point is. But beyond that, the computation is relatively easy. You go and define the relationship between measurements and your system state. You map the input to your system state, and then you're done. So what happens here? Well, OK, so this is how I do the calculations. This is my measurement. This is system state. And this is in my common gain. I'm calculating the best estimate for the current value here. If I have a low noise measurement, if that R covariance matrix goes to zero, you can see that, you know, again, remember, these are matrices, right? I do not divide matrices by each other. It's, it has to be this multiplied by the inverse of this. But I can see that at the end of the story, if I treat these like numbers to make my life easier, when R approaches zero, then my K approaches to H minus one. And then Kalman gain is not a number again, huh? It's gonna be a vector. So K uh, approaches to H minus one, so plug it into here, into this expression. What you see is that your X of K is going to be H minus one times that K, right? So basically this will cancel this. You are left with your measurement. Meaning that if, you're, if you have a really, really good sensor, trust your sensor, okay? You may benefit from having a system model here, and we actually practically we have shown that's the case in projects that we've done with different uh, companies and organizations. But if you've paid a ton of money for your sensor, well, you know, listen to it. However, 
if the difference between your system noise and, and measurement noise is not that large, you will always benefit from combining both with each other. On the other hand, if you have a really good model for this uh, system, right? So let's say I'm looking at dropping this object in vacuum. There's no air friction, there's no temperature variation, there's, you know, a very controlled mechanism to let go of this object. Then my model is actually quite good. It does a very, very good job of this um, predicting where this sensor, this device, uh, this uh, object is going to be over time. And in that case, you know, maybe my model is good and low noise. And therefore, I basically may do better if I rely more on model. And, and that means that PK, you know, that's where your process variance is, the process changes are. If PK goes to zero, this whole combination goes to zero. And you can see that, you know, your best estimate for X is essentially what your system model is telling you. And then this is what we saw again before for combining two sensors for the same source of data in the past. Now, here is an example that uh, we are going to assume that an object is propelled through, uh, let's say, a medium, an environment, using an input acceleration A in, while we measure both the acceleration and the location of this um, object. What we want to figure out is that, you know, how do we put together a system model for this situation? You know, what are the A's, B's, and uh, let's say H's to figure this, uh, the behavior of this system. So let's go and see this example. Okay, um, so first thing I need to do is that I need to figure out what my state variables are. So let's say if I have a um, state of x, I'm going to choose two variables here. One is the location, one is the velocity. So one is going to be x and one is going to be x dot, the derivative of x with respect to time, right? So that's going to be my system state. That is what I will use as, you know, uh, all the information that I need about this system at any point of time. If that's the case, I can show that, you know, for a system, you can always, you know, going back to basic mechanics, you know that x is one half a in t squared plus, uh, let's say, v in t plus, uh, actually what I'm going to do is that I'm going to look at brief also x double dot, so let's say x at any location is that, plus x dot plus x naught, okay? Or if you look at the velocity at any point of time, it's x double dot t plus the initial velocity that you had, okay? So these are what I know from basic mechanics. And uh, if I want to go and say, well, I was here at t minus 1, and where am I now? I can go and relate these two to each other. So my matrix A is going to be, um, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. So remember, A times my location at the previous point. So I'm going to write it here. So, let's say A, A times xk minus 1, this should give me xk, right? So, xk minus 1 is your x at the previous data point, xk minus 1, and velocity 
at the previous data point. And you want to extract xk and x dot k from this. Well, look at these two equations here. You know, forgetting about the acceleration term, you can show that your new value for x comes from whatever you had before plus this times delta t. So it's going to be 1 times delta t, right? And for new value for the velocity, well, the displacement doesn't do anything for you anymore. You get the velocity that you had in the past. So this is if you have no acceleration, okay? So that's my A. What is B? Um, well, let me, let's keep this stuff. Um, B is the acceleration. B is um, what is pushing my system forward. So, uh, sorry, the mapping, right? So the input is an acceleration. It's some A in. It's a force, and I have a mass, and I can calculate A in. But I don't have acceleration in my system variable. So I need a mapping between what the input is and what my system variables are. So if, if my, uh, so this means that, let me, u, the input vector is, let's say, a n, or uh, I can write it like 1 times a n. I need a matrix to map that input into my state. So my state is uh, location and velocity. If I have that, I can show that B has to be Why? Because you have an acceleration here, right? So if I want to get displacement and velocity on the left side, I have to multiply the acceleration by delta t squared divided by 2. And in order to get velocity, I need to multiply acceleration by delta t. So that's your b, right? And then what you're doing here is that your z vector Finally, your z vector is, you're measuring x, acceleration, and uh, location. You're measuring those two parameters. And you want to convert that to x. You want to find an h vector that converts this, uh, the system variables, into this. So h takes your system variables x and x dot into that. And then that way you can see that h has to be like this. Right? So h times your x and x dot. If you multiply them, then your first vector, uh, your first element of your z vector is x and then if you multiply the second row of your h vector by x dot, uh, you get x dot divided by delta t, or taking the derivative of that, uh, which, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, which will give you your acceleration. We need acceleration here, right? So it's the derivative of uh, your velocity. So that's your h vector. Uh, so let me get rid of this now. And we had A, B, uh, the A, the system model, B, the input mapping to your system variables, and H, the measurement mapping to your system variables. And all you need to do is to go and figure out uh, matrices uh, W and uh, V, right? So W is the process noise, V is your sensor noise, and calculate the covariances of these matrices. Once you do that, you basically have all the important information that you need for uh, implementing a Kalman filter. So, assuming you did that, here's uh, 
a simple case. Here's a simple example. So in this case, what I assumed is that I have an object that is initially sitting at the origin, right? So let's say x naught is zero and uh, x dot naught is zero, basically zero location, zero velocity. And I apply acceleration as shown here. So it has an acceleration of 0.2 meters per second squared and the acceleration drops and then goes up. It's a quadratic relationship, just a random uh, input acceleration. And I apply this acceleration. This is my propeller uh, that is running my system. So that's the U part. I want to see what my system output is going to be. I assume that my process noise is 0.1 and my sensor noise is 0.3, right? So these are unitless numbers at this point of time. But what I mean here is that I, I had more trust in my um, process than my sensor. And this is the output. This is for that same model that we just described. This is the output, right? So you can see that, you know, this crosses these little X's uh, on the top and bottom of the curve are the measurements. Obviously, the sensor is following what is happening in real um, life. The model um, is the solid line, as you can see here. And then if you, I think you have to look a bit closely here, you see a dashed line that actually is less noisy than both your model and your um, measurement. And that's what we wanted. We wanted a less noisy output. So, yeah, it looks a bit complicated. We covered a lot in that, let's say, few slides. The Kalman filter usually, you know, is a, is a topic that they cover in more depth than that. Uh, the idea here that what I wanted to transfer to you or teach to you over these past couple of slides was that, yes, we can go from you know, combining a bunch of sensor data to a more complex system where you combine the sensor data with virtual sensors now and you improve the performance. It's nothing scary. The computation is relatively simple. You just have to have a little bit of experience and engineering insight to figure out especially, you know, what is your process noise at the beginning. Once you figure that part and you assemble the system properly or the system variables and states properly, then the common filter computations are very straightforward. There's tons of actually now these open source and um, proprietary packages out there that can do it for you. And as I said, it can be implemented as a, on, a, on you know, nowadays any microcontroller. Uh, but the part that I think you guys have to and gals go and focus on and then make sure that you understand well is combination of sensor data from multiple similar sensors. Uh, let's focus on physical sensors for now. If we, uh, you know, um, done nothing virtual and make sure that you understand those concepts well. As I said, you know, nowadays it is very common to pay more for a bunch of, you know, inexpensive sensors and combine the data from them in order to beat a high performance sensor out there. Multiple examples out there actually do, an ex uh, they do a quick search. Um, for example, there was an earthquake sensor that was made this, uh, this way a while ago. And there is, uh, there is a lot more information and then examples that you can find on the net. So we take advantage of the cheap sensors that we have and we do something that we couldn't do with a few of those, well, one of those sensors alone. And that's that for sensor fusion section. I'm going to have uh, assignments posted for this information soon so that you will see, you know, the type of problems that you should be able to solve based on the information we discussed here. And then the next thing we are going to move in, move to is the sensor signal processing for, uh, uh, let's say, statistical learning and then figuring out context from data, not just uh, numbers and thresholds. So until then, stay safe, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.